you. Praise God. Love that song. I feel like we're prophesying and just speaking out that life, that we will be a church. We will be an expectant bride. We will be. doesn't matter if anybody else doesn't hear, we will have ears to hear. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, my message today is Waging War with Your Prophecies. Interesting title, huh? Felt like it was time. I felt like it was time. But before I bring this message, I have a word for John, our guest today. Not to embarrass you, just to let you know that God sees your heart. And I see your heart. He's been showing me through worship your heart. And I see someone with a very compassionate, tender spirit. And that you love to serve and you love to give. And that God has a plan and a destiny for your life. I see you literally serving ministers. Um, like I actually had a vision of you like going on a missions trip, but you were actually carrying the suitcases of the ministers. You were there to attend and serve. I see you with a heart for children, for feeding people, for uh, hurting people, for the homeless. Um, the Lord's just showing me this about you. And he has a plan to use you in his kingdom of God. There's a place for you. And he wants you to know that, that there's a place for you in his house. And he needs people that will love and serve. And I see both those gifts in you. So, God bless you. Praise God. Any of that hit home? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Praise God. Okay. To the word, to the word, to the word. The scripture I'm going to be basing this teaching on is 1 Timothy 1.18. 1 Timothy 1.18. Anybody know that scripture by heart? Yeah, that, Matt's back there. That's Matt. Okay. <laughs> I recognize the voice, but I didn't see you. <laughs> this charge I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. When were they previously made? At his ordination. That by them you may wage the good warfare. Anybody think warfare is good? God just called it good. But he said he wants you to wage good warfare, which must mean there must be bad warfare too. we got to learn how to wage the good warfare. Amen? Too many believers get stuck in the bad. Having faith and a good conscience, we need both to be confident, faith and a good conscience. Amen? If, you have a, if your conscience isn't clear before God, it's very hard to have faith. Hello? Amen. Having faith and a good conscience, which, listen to this, having rejected concerning the faith, some have suffered shipwreck. Wow. So what that says is that you can be shipwrecked, your faith can be shipwrecked by rejecting prophetic words. Wow. And by not warring over them with good warfare. None of us want to be shipwrecked, amen? <laughs> okay. How many of you have had, I would think most of us, have had prophetic words spoken over your life? Someone, um, whether it's the pastor or a minister or uh, an intercessor, someone um, has a word for you. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit where they have a word of prophecy, exhortation, encouragement, or um, speaking into your life like what I just did with John. I see this for you. Those are prophetic words that God speaks over our lives. Um, how many of you are still waiting for some of them, if not all of them, to come to pass? Hello? Oh, only a couple of you? Come on. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> I'm waiting for a lot to come to pass. I have a whole list I'm waiting for. Amen? So what do you do with these words, and what do you do while you're waiting? Unfortunately, a lot of us get discouraged. We kind of tuck them away if we even wrote them down at all. Or if they're recorded, we kind of throw the CD in with the pile of the rest of the CDs. And we kind of walk away from it because it doesn't happen when. Right away. Right? Away. <laughs> That'd be nice. right? And it doesn't happen how. That's right. Right? God's not on our time clock. That's 
right? And there is a strategy in this. There's a strategy where Timothy said that we're to war over the prophecies that are in our life. And in doing so, he said, in doing so, we are fighting the good fight. How are we fighting the good fight? By warring over the prophetic words that have been spoken over our lives. By warring over them. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's lots of scriptures on spiritual warfare, right? Ephesians 6 says we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says we're supposed to cast down imaginations, right? These battle strategies are good for all the time. You're always supposed to put on the, good, uh, on the whole armor of God, and you're always supposed to cast down imaginations. But what we need is specific strategies and specific weapons for specific times. Okay? There's the word of God that speaks generally to us, but then there needs to be that specific word that God is speaking to you. Now, here's an example. God told uh, Joshua to have all the men of fighting age march around the walls of Jericho seven times. Well, is that the strategy he's given you? No. Some of you may get a little Jericho moment and march around and shout and, you know, around your house or around your kid's bedroom or something and start blowing some trumpets. But, but we need the right strategy for every battle, right? That was something that God told Joshua. He said, march around seven times, then have the priest blow the trumpet and everybody shout and the walls came down. That was a specific strategy for a specific battle, wasn't it? Amen? Praise God. There's many warfare scriptures in the Bible. I hope you know them. I hope you know most of them, if not all of them. But the key for every one of us in the body of Christ is to discern which strategy God is leading you to by his spirit for now. What is he illuminating to you now for this season you're in? What is the spirit of the Lord speaking to you about your situation? And then once you know that, how do you place it into action? How do you actually do this? So today is going to be really a really teaching in the prophetic. But um, what I believe that God has led me to for this message is that this is the time and the season that the Holy Spirit is breathing this scripture to us. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. That it is time for us, according to the prophecies that have been spoken about each one of us, and this is not just individual, this is also corporately. What has God spoken about the church? What has God spoken about the body of Christ? What's he spoken about the nation. So you take it to different levels. What's he spoken to you personally? What's he spoken about your family? What's he spoken about your church, your job, whatever it is. But it's time to pull them out. Those prophetic words that you kind of gave up on. Oh, come on. Am I the only one in here? Or is this the same Holy Spirit speaking to all of us? Hello? Because <laughs> we all ought to be feeling the same thing. He wants to stir that back up in us because listen, it's now. Now is the time for the fulfillment of all those things that you've been waiting for. All those things you've been holding on to. God is saying, now I want you to stir your faith up in them again. I want you to pull them out again. I want you to start praying over them, declaring them, reading them. Hello. Okay. Now another translation says in the New um, New International Version says, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, that by recalling them, ah, you may fight the battle well. Wow, what a translation. By recalling, bringing them to recollection. Recalling something means if I called it and I'm recalling it, what's, what happens when your car has a recall? They're calling it back so they can fix it, right? He said by recalling those prophecies, he said you will fight your battle well. Yeah. Oh, that speaks volumes to me. 
We need to recall those prophecies. Another translation, which is a very unusual translation, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Many of you haven't heard of that. But I love the wording. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you so that by them you may strongly engage in battle. Wow, because what's getting attacked in your life is that word. The word, your potential, your destiny is what's getting attacked. So the way that you strongly engage in the battle for your destiny in your life is to come into alignment and recall those prophetic words that have been spoken over you. God said... Hello? Yes. I mentioned my son Mark that he was called from my womb. When I became pregnant with Mark, I had prophetic words spoken about his destiny while he was in my womb. But Mark was born a month premature. And I was told by the doctors and the nurses in the hospital, do not send out birth announcements yet. Now, what just happened? That prophetic word over my son's destiny just became warfare. Yes. Hello? Yes. And I began recalling the words of the Lord over my son and his destiny, and I will be sending out birth announcements because God blessed me and gave me this son. And devil, you're a liar, and I don't care what the doctors say. I, I had nurses going, oh, such a shame, such a shame. Looking at him, yes, Lord rebuke you, Satan. Amen? Amen? Because you can't be moved by what you see, by what you hear, by what others are telling you. You You've got to know that you know that you know this is what God said. That's and that's how you become strong in battle. It says that you may strongly engage in battle. That in itself speaks volumes because a lot of Christians are MIA when it comes to engaging in battle. Listen, you're talking to somebody that led prayer in a church for many years. I led it probably longer than anybody else at that, that, that particular facility that I was at. But I've led church, uh, prayer in every church I've ever been in. And listen, I actually had some people say to me, I don't like all that warfare stuff. <laughs> so you know what my answer to them after years of doing this was? So then you want us to do the warring for you? That's it, yeah. Right. So you want us to make it easy on you? You want us to do your battle? You want us to do your warfare? You need to be engaging in warfare. You need to be engaging in the battle. What if half of the army of the United States decided, we don't like all this warfare stuff, we're checking out. We're in an army. we got to think like soldiers. Amen? Ooh, hello. All right. Another translation, the New English translation says, to, in keeping with the prophecies, in order that with such encouragement you may fight the good fight. Hallelujah. Encouragement. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says prophecies are for what? They're for edifying, Amen. for strengthening, and encouraging. Amen. He said, I want you to be encouraged as you engage in this warfare. This will encourage you. You get discouraged when you put your weapons down. You get discouraged when you walk away from a prophetic word. Hello? When you turn your back on what God says is yours. This is your destiny. This is your call. Hello? Oh, I want to fight like I never fought before because now is the time to possess the promise. Now is the time. Listen, this is the last days. If you're waiting for another time, it ain't coming. If you want it, it's now. Everything that we've been waiting for is now. Oh, but God is saying, 1 Timothy 1.18, church, He's saying, stir up, stir up. Prophecies are for your encouragement. They're to build you up. They're to comfort you. They're to strengthen you. They're also to help you see what God has for your life. How many of you have just prayed, I don't know what to do. I don't know what God has for me. I don't know what God wants. Hello? 
But then all of a sudden, Mr. Prophet comes to town. And Mr. Prophet says, you over there with the blonde hair and the pretty one stand, you know, I've got a word for the Lord from, you know, from you, for you. And, and he stands, you stand up and then all of a sudden he starts prophesying destiny over you. When I first got saved, I had so many words, pack your suitcase, get your passport, you're going to nations, you're going to travel, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. I'm still here. <laughs> it's time, you know, church, it's time to get a hold of the word of God and say, Lord, I got my passport, I got my suitcases, I'm ready. <laughs> now open those nations, open those doors, amen? That's just one little thing, but you know what I'm saying is that you get the prophetic word of the Lord and then what happens? Years go by. What happened with Abraham? You're going to have a son. Yeah. How many years? And he was already dead, and his wife's womb was already dead when he got the word. Yes. 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 Hello? And he still waited 25 more years. Took matters into his own hands, made an Ishmael, made a mess. Yeah. And God still was faithful to the promise. Yeah. God still came through for him yes. in spite of <laughs> his failures. Amen? Amen? The Amplified Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.18, be inspired and aided by the prophetic words. Be inspired by them. Something that inspires you motivates you. It gets you going. It says be inspired and aided by them. That's a tool. God's given you these words as tools to assist you in battle. It says, be inspired and aided by the prophetic words that you may wage the good warfare. Hallelujah. Am I speaking to anybody yet? Amen. The New Living Translation. I just want to stir you up. Just think if, okay, I don't know how many are here this morning. It doesn't matter. But if every one of us had a prophetic word given to us about our destiny, which I'm sure every one of us has, and this month they all came to pass, <laughs> this place would never be the same. Hello? This place would explode with the power of the Lord. Think about that. You got to get your faith to a new place. We got to start expecting. We have to start believing. The New Living Translation says that prophetic words help you fight well in the Lord's battles. They help you to fight well. Listen, when the doctors told me don't send out birth announcements to Mark, for Mark, those prophetic words helped me to fight well. Amen. It was the Lord's battle over his destiny and his life, and I had to take those words to fight well. Amen. Do you understand that? Amen. So he says to fight the good fight. Oh, here's one more translation because it just keeps expounding on it. The message translation tells us that prophecy should make you fearless in your struggle. Prophecies make you fearless because when the doctor said, don't send out birth announcements, I was fearless. I said, oh, yes, I will. Do you understand? It makes you fearless in your struggle, keeping a firm grip on your faith and on yourself. Oh, there's two things there. Keep a firm grip on your faith, but what's the other one? Keep a firm grip on yourself. What does that mean? Snap out of it. Come on, self. Line up with the word of God. Keep a grip on yourself. You tell your kids sometimes, get a grip. Get a grip. Come on, church, get a grip. Oh, okay, I'll keep going. By the end of this, you're going to really... <laughs> what makes warfare good? He said it's a good warfare. That must mean there's a bad warfare. Yeah. <laughs> the bad warfare is when you're getting the snot beat out of you. The devil is whooping your butt and kicking you to the curb. That ain't good warfare. How many Christians do you know that are sitting on the curb, crying, whining, oh, yeah. licking their wounds? Yeah. Oh, the devil did this and the devil did that. Oh, my goodness. Get a grip. 
You have been clothed with power and righteousness, and you're armed with the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Put your armor on. Cast down your imaginations. Get a grip and start fighting the good warfare. Oh, is any warfare good? It's good if you win. Hello? You don't go into a fight thinking I'm going to lose. No. But I think a lot of Christians do that. Sure. I don't know. I, they're already defeated before they start to fight. Right. But it's good when you know you win. Amen. I don't go in it to lose. I go in it because I already won. Amen. Then I can fearlessly go in and fight. Amen. Because if God said it, I didn't say it. God said it. Amen. You're not standing on your own words. You would get squashed like a bug. You're standing on God's words. You're standing on thus saith the Lord. So then your warfare is a good warfare because, you know, you've heard this taught many times when those soldiers go over to another country and they represent the United States, they're there saying, thus says the President of the United States. Thus says the people of the United States. You can go this far and no more. Do you understand that concept? Or we've heard the illustration of police officers. They have the badge. They have the gun. And they say, stop in the name of the law. Right. The law. We serve the lawmaker, the lawgiver, the law enforcer. And when we wage good warfare, we're saying, thus says the law. Yeah. Thus says the Lord. That's right. The king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, whom I represent. Yes. Problem is, we don't see ourselves as his representatives. We see ourselves as little defeated nothings. That's the enemy's tactic. But part of that warfare, he says, is keep a firm grip on yourself. Amen. Yep. Tell yourself who you are. Amen. Wow. Now, in this fight, Ephesians 6, 12 says we fight unseen enemies. Isn't that true? Yeah. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, which we can see, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Unfortunately, sometimes that's all you're looking at. You're looking at unseen forces. But thankfully, the unseen God and his unseen angels are on your side. Hello? The angels are just as important to your warfare as what you say and do. How can you say that? I'm going to show you in scripture how I can say that. When you war, do you remember when Jesus was so exhausted in the Garden of Gethsemane? What does the Bible say? God sent an angel to strengthen him. Right? I preached on Elijah last week. And he just ran out to the cave. He was so exhausted. And God said, what are you doing here? But God sent an angel to strengthen him. Have you ever asked God to send you an angel to strengthen you? I have. Why not? God's no respecter of persons. If he did it for Elijah, he'll do it for you. See yourself that way. See, in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel had a prophetic vision, okay? And he went into prayer and fasting for three weeks. And what happened? He had an angelic encounter and the angel came and told him three weeks fasting and prayer. Some of you fast and pray three days. You think you did something. Fasting and praying for three weeks, 21 days. And the angel said to him, from the first day, from day one of your prayer and fasting, God didn't, you didn't have to pray and fast 14 days and twist God's arm to get him to hear you. 
He says, from the first day you set your heart to understand this and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Hallelujah. God heard you the first day you started praying and fasting. The very first day. But then he says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. He said, I was on my way from day one. God heard you. But there was warfare over that vision for three weeks while you were praying and fasting. I was up there doing battle. The angel was warring over the word for him. See, God heard him, and the answer was send an angel to war. Wow. Now think about that. Angels didn't stop their assignment back then. They're still warring in the heavenlies. They're still warring on our behalf. And the Bible says that they obey the voice of the Lord. Wow. Psalm 103, verse 20. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones, who do his bidding, who obey his word. Wow. Another translation. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones, who carry out his plans. Wow. Listening for each of his commands. Another translation, King James. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Hallelujah. Now, we've got to talk about what that means, because a lot of you think, well, if God said it to Daniel, you know, then that's something he said in the Bible. God's word is his word. God speaks in many ways. One of the ways he speaks is through the whole word of God, the Logos. Every bit, oh, my Bible's in my case. Every bit of the word of God is called the Logos. Then there's the specific word in scripture that God speaks to you, and that's a rhema word. And then there's also the word of prophecy. Oh, that counts. Yes, did God say it? If God said it, and it's a true, proven, prophetic word that's scriptural and not, you know, woo-woo, you can bet your life on it. Hello? We're afraid to believe. Oh, it's too good to be true. Yes, it is. Jesus died for you. Too good to be true. Yes, it is. Your sins are forgiven. Too good to be true. Yes, it is. God says, I have hope in a future for you. Plans for good and not evil. Too good to be true. Yes, it is. It is by grace we're saved. It's grace. We don't deserve this. We can't earn this. But you need to receive it. You'd be stupid not to. It's like winning a lottery ticket and say, oh, I don't deserve all that money. Run to the bank. If you don't want it, give it to the church, but don't be foolish. (laughs) You get handed something, take it, right? So how do the angels hearken to the voice of the word? How do they do it? Through us. Through us. We pray it. We decree it. We declare it. We meditate on what God says. We get it deep down in our spirit. And then when it becomes deep in our spirit, we start praying it. We start decreeing it. We declare, thus says the Lord. See, God wants a thus says the Lord in your mouth. There's no other authority. There is no thus saith Judy. (laughs) There's no thus saith Al except in Barnegat because he's, you know, a politician there. But I embarrass you. But it's not thus saith you. It's just like what I said. A soldier steps on foreign soil. The minute he gets off that plane, he's on foreign soil. He says, thus says the President of the United States. Thus says the people I represent. When you speak, you say, thus says the Lord. There's nothing higher. There's nothing higher. Whoa. It carries an authority with it. That 
little private soldier who probably has one little stripe or pin or something carries the authority of the whole government. It doesn't matter whether he's a general, a commander, or a private. He still carries the same authority of the same government. Yes. Oh, I'm only saved six months. Doesn't matter. Six months, 40 years, doesn't matter. Your thus says the Lord is just as powerful and has just as much authority as someone who's been saved 50 years. Amen. Wow. I'm trying to think of who. That would be like Billy Graham or somebody, you know, <laughs> who's been saved that long and preaching that long. Like a Billy Graham, like a Pat Robertson. When they say, God said, what do we all do? Whoa, God told him. Because why? He has longevity. He has credibility. We know he hears from God. We know he's, he's got this reputation of a man of God that walks with God. Well, the same thus saith the Lord that's in their mouth needs to be in your mouth. Amen. Whoa. Yes, we need to come up higher. So what does this all come down to? What does this all come down to? We are told to fight the good fight of faith. Aren't we? That's what I've been talking about. But it's the fight of faith that is greater than the fight with the enemy. The fight with the enemy has already been done. I love that scripture says he was defeated and disarmed. He's got no feet and no arms. Hello? <laughs> Already done. The cross took care of everything. His, he's done. He's just a loud bop, 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 right? But he has no power and authority over a saint, over a child of God. The battle and the fight, what is the good fight? The good fight is a good fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. It's your belief. Now you're getting quiet on me. I'll take it to the next level. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look, the enemy is real. There's no question about it. I've lived in the path of his destruction in my past. I know what he can do. But the fight we fight is to believe that God's word is true. And in the face, especially, of circumstances that are contrary to God's word. God prophesies over you, where is he, Tony, that you're going to be a millionaire. And the car breaks down, the washing machine breaks down, uh, you get bills you didn't know were coming, you know, and all of a sudden, there's the word of the Lord, I'm a millionaire, <laughs> and everything's falling apart and you can't pay your bills. That's where the good fight comes. That's where the good fight comes in. It's a fight of faith. It's the good fight of faith. That's the real battle. That's the real war. It's where you live. Hello? It's where you live. Listen, it's time to go back and remind yourself of the prophetic words that were spoken over your life. What made you stop believing them? Think about that. What made you give up on them? Sometimes it's hope deferred. Right. Bible says hope deferred makes your heart sick. Maybe you've been looking at your circumstances. Maybe it's taken a really long time and you're just worn out. Been there, done that? Anybody else? Hello? Yeah. So I just tell you I'm that way because I know you'll have to, you know, you're not alone. There's nothing new to you that hasn't been to somebody else. But the devil's biggest thing is that you're the only one. That's one of his tactics. You're the only one. 
Right, liar, liar, pants on fire. Yes, go to hell early. Pants on fire. Listen, you're not the only one. The Bible says it's common to all of us. What you hear, I hear. What I hear, you hear. Here's another one of his. I love exposing him. If they only knew. Call me a break. I'll get up and give my testimony, and then they'll all know, and they'll all give glory to God, and you have nothing else you can use on me. Right. Hello? Yeah. Shut him up. Put him in his place. Don't be afraid of him. Right. Amen. He'll say to every one of you, if they really knew what you were really like, if they really knew what you did, if they really knew your past, who cares? Yeah. One of my dearest friends, he was entrenched in a life of homosexuality and drugs for years. His father had beaten and abused him as a child, hit him with a board. He was deaf in one of his ears. That man was terrified to give his testimony. He got up, and he, this was during his water baptism, and he gave his testimony. He was shaken. He was so afraid to tell people his past. Because the devil says, oh, if they only knew, right? Right. Yeah. When he gave his testimony and he got water baptized, I ran up to him after service and I put my arms around him and I said, I love Jesus so much more now because of what he did for you. That he set you free and he healed your broken heart. That testimony only made me love Jesus more. It didn't make me think less of him. It made me hate the devil more and love Jesus more. Amen? Listen, by faith, Hebrews 11.2 says, the elders obtained a good report and a good testimony. That's your good testimony. What your testimony is going to be, God did this, I was this, or I didn't have this, or I was broke, or I was beat up, or I was rejected, or abandoned, or whatever it is. I was sick. I was dying on my deathbed. But God... The word of the Lord that came to pass in my life. The elders obtained a good report, a good testimony. The Bible says, by faith. Yeah. That doesn't mean I hope it happens. I wish it had happened. I'm waiting for it to happen. I'm looking for it to happen. Bible says, Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith yeah. is. Amen. Oh, come on. That means Every single time faith is now. What happened was your faith was two years ago when you got the word. Or your faith was when you got the word ten years ago. But faith needs to be now. Amen. Now faith is. What is faith? It's a substance. It's a spiritual substance of things that I'm hoping for but I don't see yet. I can look at you and I can see substance in you. I tell Al all the time, that's why you're an elder. Because he speaks substance all the time. He says, God said it, it's going to happen. Amen. I say, that's why you're an elder. Because he's speaking substance. Don't tell me what, how many chairs are empty in this room. Tell me you see it full. Tell me you see them waiting in the parking lot lined up to get in. Tell me you see the next building. Tell me you see what God's going to do. Don't tell me what the circumstances look like. Amen. Hello? Yeah. Don't tell me what your checkbook looks like. Don't tell me what the doctor says. Don't send out birth announcements. Well, my God said, yeah. Amen. Woo. Yeah. now faith is. Amen. Period. Amen. That's right. Faith is. Yeah. It is. Faith exists. I heard Kenneth Copeland preach years ago, have faith in your faith. Amen. We don't have faith in our faith because it's our faith. And we don't think it's strong enough. One of my favorite verses in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, talking about Abraham. Abraham believed God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which are not as though they already were. Oh, Tony, you're loaded. Yeah. 
Amen. You're a millionaire. Because God said so. Amen. God said so. We need to speak what God says. Amen. Abraham believed God who gives life to the dead. Life to the dead. John 11:40. Lazarus was dead in the tomb. His body stunk. It was decaying. It was corroding. Amen? Amen. Rigor mortis was already set in. Jesus waited, the Bible says, three days. Three days. Master, the one you love is sick. Hmm. Three days, three years. What difference does it make? Right. We're still waiting, right? Amen. But when somebody's dead, it seems like an eternity. It seems like it's too late. Right? He waited. And he came. And he says to Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the life. She says, I know on the last day we're all going to get raised up. See, she wasn't getting it yet. He's, he didn't say this, but he was waiting on purpose. He was waiting till the Jews and the Jewish leaders, all the Pharisees and scribes, they all gathered around. All the mourners were there now. All the critics were there now. He waited till they all got there. Then he showed up. Because he wanted a bigger audience. He wanted a bigger voice to speak out. And he looks at Martha. And what did he say to her? I love this. Martha, didn't I tell you? If you believed, you'd see the glory of God. Isn't that what we want to see? We want to see the glory of God. And she says, but by now, he's dead and he stinks. How many of you have told God, my situation is dead now? It stinks, God. I can't stand it, God. I've lived in it too long, God. Rigor mortis is setting in, God. Amen. Right? Yes. God, I can't take it anymore. Amen. Oh. But there's Abraham. Bible says in verse 18, Abraham believed God, what? In hope against hope. Hope against all hope. It says he believed God contrary to hope. Contrary. That means in spite of how it looked. It looked contrary. He looks pretty dead to me, God. You're saying life, and I'm seeing death, right? Amen. Contrary means the opposite of what we're hoping for and the opposite of what we're believing. Shh. He believed contrary to what it looked like, in spite of what it looked like, in hope against hope and against all odds. Amen. I've said this to John in the past. We're up against all odds. Glory to God. Glory to God. How many people have said it'll never happen for you? How many people, how many of your own thoughts have said it'll never happen for me? Or it's too late for me? Oh, church, it's time to stir up the prophetic words and wage war with them. Verse 20 says that Abraham did not waver at the promise. What's a promise? A prophetic word. It says, <clears throat> he didn't waver through unbelief. Waver means go back and forth and be double-minded. Back and forth, back and forth. But, verse 21, he was fully convinced, fully persuaded that what God promised, he would do. Oh my goodness. There's the fight of faith right there. Are you fully convinced and fully persuaded? Yes. What does that mean? To full means to the brim. That's right. It means full capacity. To the top. I am full of persuasion. Yes. I'm full of persuasion. Yes. Hallelujah. There's the fight. 
We need to become full of persuasion, fully persuaded, fully convinced that God said it over my life. Who? Me? Little old me? Oh, you can't mean me, God. Get rid of that talk. That's right. Amen. Yes, you. That's right. Why not you? Amen. Right? Yes. Fully convinced, fully persuaded, not because of you or who you are or what your circumstances are, but because God. God said it. Yes. God said it. Listen, this isn't the gift of faith. A lot of you can hide behind a gift of faith. Oh, well, Abraham just had a gift of faith. No, he didn't. Because the Bible says he was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God while he waited. It wasn't a gift of faith because he was strengthened in his faith. He was strengthened. His faith grew stronger while he waited. Wow. He was waiting for that prophetic word that you're going to become the father of many nations to be fulfilled and come to pass. And it definitely looked dead. He looked at Sarah, who was 99, I think, years old, She's pretty close to dead, God. And her womb is way past dead. Hello? See, God delights in the impossible. He delights in the miraculous. He likes to show off. He likes to do the impossible. Amen? It says he had unwavering faith and gave glory to God before he ever saw the answer. Some of you stop praising God for the answer. Some of you stop thanking God. You don't do it when you get it. Of course you do it when you get it. But faith has it already. It's the evidence of things not yet seen. Well, you don't see it, but you see my faith. That's the evidence. What's evidence? You go to court, you have evidence. The evidence is the proof. This substance called faith right here is the proof that I have the promise. Oh, then the judge says, case closed. Case closed. They have the proof. They have the evidence. It's theirs. Oh, devil says, well, you don't have it yet. You don't see it yet. Here's the proof. Faith, now faith is the substance. It's a substance of things hoped for and proof of things not yet seen. It's a fight of faith. Romans 5.2 says we access by faith. We have access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. Hallelujah. We're standing in grace, and we access it by faith. Hallelujah. He says, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Yes. We need to start rejoicing in hope. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. They rejoiced in the hope of the glory of God. Hallelujah. Didn't I tell you if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Amen. Yes. Now I'm, I'm getting ready to close. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes, what? By hearing. By hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I love those two words. Faith comes. Faith comes. It comes. It will come. How do I get this faith? How do I do this? Faith comes by hearing. Amen? Faith will move toward you as you hear that word over and over and over. It's an audibly hearing of God's voice. Hearing is audible. Faith comes by audibly hearing the prophetic words. If you've got them on CD, it's time to pull them out and hear it over and over and over until something. See, Jesus said that his word becomes flesh in us. 
You hear it, and it's a head thing. But sooner or later, it starts soaking its way down and penetrating its way down to your spirit. And something supernatural happens where all of a sudden, that hearing becomes faith. And then the faith obtains what you're hoping for. Glory to God. So faith comes, the common English Bible says, by listening over and over again. That's why we tell you, get the CDs, listen to them, build your faith up. It's like you're here, not just you, I'm talking ge generically the church. They're here Sunday morning, they hear a sermon, then they go home all week, and what do they hear more of than that one hour sermon? They hear the news, they hear the negative in-laws, they hear <gasps> that what the doctor says, they hear what their boss says, they hear all this noise pollution. But how much of the word are you hearing? Mm -hmm. You need to be telling yourself audibly what God says. The Jewish Bible says through a word proclaimed, faith comes. From proclaiming, thus says the Lord. When's the last time you went through your house and said, thus says the Lord? When's the last time you spoke it over your marriage? When's the last time you spoke it over your finances? Thus says the Lord. Faith comes by hearing. Now remember I said to you, there's different words. There's the Logos word of God, which is the whole Bible. But faith comes by hearing the rhema word, the specific spoken word to you. You don't have faith in the whole logos. You do, but it's not a specific faith. You can tap into and you can say, this is what God says to me. This is mine. Now, I've heard other people say the whole Bible's rhema. Of course it is. But listen to what I'm saying. God has a spoken plan for your life. He has a specific plan. The Bible says faith comes by hearing the rhema word. Yes. The rhema word. Yeah. Sue, did God tell you your whole household's going to be saved? Then he 